how do we explore this text? How do we get through it? I'll go through the different headings and I'll remind you as we go if you're making notes. But research, I think, is a really important part of the actor's uh, process. So now at this point, you've read it three times. So you have a good grasp of the story and what's happening. Why do we need to research? Uh, if I was cast in a, a movie set in London in the 1950s, amazing, um, I now have to go and research that time period. So uh, what was the fashion like? What was the political climate? Who was in power? Uh, what was it like in the country at the time? What job did I do? Um, how did that affect me psychologically? Um, you can get so much information from the research that you do. And research, it doesn't have to be academic, you know, it can be, it can be creative. Like we said before about the sketchbook, you know, um, if you want to uh, use YouTube, for example, a fantastic resource that we've got as actors, we're so lucky to have um, so much at our disposal. Um, go on there and research your time period, find uh, examples of people who lived then. You can listen to different accents and study different characters on YouTube. I think it's a fascinating resource for us as, as actors. Uh, the next thing I should mention, um, in terms of your research, you can collect images. So as I said before, if you're a visual person, and I'm quite visual, I would like to collect images that inspire me about the world. So I might collect images of the fashion or people of the time and make a mood board and keep that then in my, in my book. Um, if you're someone who really loves music and you respond to music, find music of the time period and play that or songs that inspire you for a particular character because you've read it so many times. Now you have a grasp of that world. What's, what's coming up for you? What's, what's inspiring you? Also quotes, ideas, real people who you could base your character on. So many things that you could collect. Um, and if you're someone who sketches or scribbles, you can, you can do that. But that's the first thing I think you need to do is your research. Secondly, a map. I think we need to make a map quite early on of the relationships um, between the different characters in the story. So I would go back to the beginning, fourth reading now, and now draw for yourself as you're reading the relationships of the people. I've got an example to show you. I'm sorry if it's backwards, but it doesn't matter because it's just circles. This is a very basic idea of what um, a character map could look like. Say this is the main character. You're not playing that character, but they get the biggest circle because they are the main protagonist. Your characters here, I would still put them in the middle of the, of the map because we're all the leader of our own story. You know, we're all the, the main character in our own narrative. But you will go here and then mark out where uh, the relationships link. If you don't particularly care for this character, they may get a small uh, circle, especially if they don't influence you very much. But you can be as creative and as detailed or as, as plain as you like with it. But it's just for you to make sense of what's going on and who, uh, who everybody is to everyone. So we've got research and we've got a map of our relationships. The next thing I think we need to do is create a timeline. Now, I think the timeline is super useful because it's a timeline of events that have happened in the story. Now, you'll hear the word event banded about quite a lot in acting, especially in acting classes. And lots of people have different ideas about what that means. But for me, an event is simply a moment. It's a moment. It could be somebody entering a room or it could be a whole party that lasts hours, depending on how detailed you want to be about the event. And when you make your timeline, it might look something like this. You will create the chronology of the timeline. So from when it starts to when it finishes. Now, why have I started it halfway? I think it's because we have to always consider that every story doesn't start at the start. In fact, it starts in the middle of something always. So what came before the story started? And then for yourself, just kind of uh, make a summary, a very brief summary of what these events might be throughout the timeline. And as you can see, I've got a red line as well going through there. 
this is your character's individual journey in the story. And maybe they leave the main action for a while and come back. What were they doing when they were not the main character in the story? Um, when they were not in the main action? Find what was happening for you then and, um, and keep a chronology of that. This will be particularly useful if you're doing a film because often you're not gonna shoot in sequence. So for example, if on the first day of shooting, you're doing a car accident, um, you know your character's then been in a car accident. And then the next day, the director has decided for whatever reason, it might be something to do with money or, um, or daylight or whatever, that you have to shoot uh, a scene from before the car accident. So you, the actor, need to know where you are emotionally, physically, psychologically in that story um, and be ready for it because you, there's no good coming into the story and acting as if you've been in a car accident because that scene hasn't happened yet. So a timeline, super useful for an actor. And you can make notes as well about the shooting dates. So, oh, I'm shooting that on that date and that on that date so you can keep a track of it. So what have we covered? We've covered research, we've covered map of relationships, and we've covered a timeline of the story and your character's individual personal journey. Next, you're going to make three lists. Now, this might not work for everybody because it is very time consuming, so it depends how much time you've got with the script. But for me, I think this is a really useful way of making things clear for me as an actor about the characters in the story. The three lists have these headings. The first one is, what does my character say about everyone else? So all the other characters in the story. What, does my, what do the other characters say about my character? And what does my character say about themselves? So I'll repeat that. What does my character say about other people? What do other people say about my character? And what does my character say about themselves? You will go back to the beginning of the story and you will read it again. This time you're combing the text. So you're going through each line and finding out everything that people have said about you as the character. So if somebody mentions you, you must write out the whole line. So this is where it gets time consuming. And then reference the page number, who said it and the line it was said on. By the end of the script, you will have a full list in front of you, and you need to do that for all three scripts. Um, so you go through it three times for all three lists. When you have those lists, you will have a clear image in front of you of patterns and um, inconsistencies in the dialogue. So if people constantly say, my character is a bully, and my character says that they think that they're not a bully, you will see clearly there is opposition of opinion. Now you might have got that just from reading it, but sometimes we miss those things and it's nice to see how clear it is and how often it comes up for some characters. They seem to really have it in for you sometimes. Um, so that's a, a good way to get those images in your head clearly. And then you have those lists and you can stick them again in your actor's notebook. So what have we covered? We've covered research, the map of the relationships, the timeline, of events and direct quotes from the story, which comes in the form of three lists. The next thing I think you could try and do is hot seating. Now, some of you who've done high school or GCSE drama will know what hot seating is, um, and it cares quite a bit in drama school as well, but it's just improvising with your character and responding, um, responding in the moment. But now that you've done this, these lists and you've, you've read it quite a few times, you're in a position where you could probably do that. Now, how do you do that alone at home? There's a couple of ways of getting around this, I think. Um, if you ask yourself questions, you the actor asking the character the question, it might, be, uh, it might take the form of a practical or an abstract question. So a practical question could be simply, uh, where did you grow up? Who are your parents? Uh, what's your favorite food? Did you go to university? Do you have any children? Practical questions. Or more abstract questions like, um, if you were a perfume, what would you be? If you were a city, what would you be? If you were uh, an animal, 
or a musical instrument or a season, what would you be? Now this might open up some ideas about who this person is for you. If that's not useful to you, just don't do it. But for me, I find that really opens up my imagination when I ask myself abstract questions like that. And try it on yourself as well. If you as an actor are filling that out, how would you, how would you respond to those questions? Which also brings me on to journaling. So journaling, uh, when you're hot seating yourself, is if, if you've ever kept a journal, you will write about your day and things that are going on in your life. Do that as the character. Now, don't write, my character thinks this. Write in the first person, which just means I feel this. Now, a word on that in journaling. You have to honour what the writer has given you. So you can invent up to a point. You can't, if, you, if the writer says that your character is a vegetarian, you're probably not going to write a journal entry, uh, entry about a hamburger that you had for lunch because it's not truthful to the circumstances that you've been given. So that's one way, another way. So let's recap that. We've got research, we've got a map of relationships, we've got the timeline that the story is happening in, we've got direct quotes, your three lists, we've got another set of lists which is just questions you can ask your character, practical or abstract, and we've got journaling. If you're the sort of person who doesn't like journaling and doesn't like writing things down, that's okay. You could do a stream of consciousness, if you like, where you get your phone or a recording device and you record uh, a th free flowing thought in character. And don't limit yourself, don't censor yourself, just let yourself speak as the character and see what comes out of it. You might be surprised by some of the discoveries that you make when you attempt a stream of consciousness. That's another thing you could try. What's next? Oh yeah, uh, so backstory. Let's talk about backstory. That's another word that gets banded about in our line of work. All that means to me is history. What is the history of your character? So the writer, in my mind, has given you the skeleton of the, the character. And I think your job as the actor is to add the flesh and the breath and the life force into the character because you the actor are a vessel for the character um, and i think so long as we honor what the writer has told us like i mentioned before you can be as inventive as you like with your backstory and make it detailed i think that's our job you know to add the detail to add the the layers of performance um, it's the same with giving your character secrets, you know, or, or hidden meaning. You just got to, um, you, you've got to do that for yourself. And you don't necessarily have to share it with anyone. You don't need to share it with the director or with other actors. I mean, unless they ask and if that's useful, great. Um, but it's for you to add those layers to your performance. Oh yeah, so another thing I'd like to uh, mention is gifts. Giving another character a gift from your character. I think that's a really generous, uh, lovely way to build the world together. Now, maybe you, uh, you're working with someone who doesn't like to work that way, and that's okay. I think you've got to respect other people's processes and allow another actor to reject a gift. And the point of giving someone a gift, it could be, say, a letter, from your character to their character. It's not to manipulate them in any way or, or manipulate the story. It's to help build the story and supplement uh, the, the world that you've created outside of the, the script. And I think that's a nice, generous thing to do, but it's up to you, try it. You might work with somebody who really responds to that and then you've got this beautiful thing together, particularly if uh, you, you're working on a film and you've just met and now you're gonna do this scene, if the only thing that you can do, if you, even if you don't have time to rehearse the lines, is give them a gift, you've built something with them. So gifts. So let's recap, because I know I've thrown a lot at you. Uh, and don't worry if you've got questions about this stuff, because I, I can, I'm on social media so I can talk to you about it. So let's recap. Research, a map of the relationship, timeline of events, what's happened, 
the direct quote, so your three lists, the given circumstances. Um, oh, no, I haven't mentioned that, have I? I'll come back to that. Uh, hot seating, so your uh, practical and abstract lists. Journaling um, in the first person or stream of consciousness. Creating a backstory, uh, giving your character secrets or hidden messages or gifts for other actors. Um, let me just quickly come back though, because given circumstances, that's another um, term that's bounded about. What is that? I think it's just the parameters that the writer has given you to play in. It's what is actually happening in the moment and um, what is the information that we've got to go on. So that sounds quite complicated. So how do we break that down? I have some questions you can ask yourself in every single scene that you're in. And if you're writing this down, it goes like this. Who am I? And that's in relation to others, plus my age, name, etc. Where am I? So what country, what address, the exact location, what room? Where, um, uh, when is it? So what year, what season, uh, what time of day, minute? It will affect the way you perform something, believe it or not. Um, what do I want? We're gonna come back to wants later when I show you this table. Um, what do I need? Now a need is different to a want. I worked with a fantastic acting coach called Bridget Panette. She wrote a book called Essential Acting. And she introduced me to a list called Universal Needs. You can Google Universal Needs and this will come up. But it's everything that a human being needs to be happy and to survive. And often a character wants something that they don't necessarily need. So the character might want to be listened to and so they're angry, I want you to listen to me. But actually what they need might be comfort. So it, it simplifies everything. And I think that's a really useful thing to consider for actors. And then finally, in your given circumstances, what has happened in the last 24 hours for your character? You need to consider that in every single scene that you are in because otherwise you come in and it's like you just start acting. You need to be acting way before you come in. You need to be thinking about what's just happened, where am I coming from, how am I feeling, bring all that in with you, that's your job. So, okay, I'll recap that one more time before we move on to this table. So research, map of the relationships, timeline, Direct quotes, so your three lists, the given circumstances, hot seating, which can take the form of practical and abstract questions, journaling, backstory, stream of consciousness, giving your character secrets and hidden meanings, and giving gifts to other characters. So now we've covered the first part of the session. Let me just check, yes, I've got time. Now let's move on to the second stage. Um, let's talk about objectives and super objectives, which is what the character wants. I said I would return. Um, remember I mentioned about your script and you've broken, it, you've broken it up and you've left a page. On this page, I would like you to write four columns with these headings. If you can't read them, I'll read them out. So what is your motivation or objective? That just means what do you want? So what my character wants in that moment, the action. Now actioning is something that actors come across a lot. And that is just, what do you do? What is the verb that you can play? Um, and a verb is just a doing word. So what the character does to get what they want, the means, how they play their action. So that's the adjective, that's the describing word. How am I doing that action? And then the obstacle, what is in the way of them getting what they want? So I'll give you an example now. If my line was stop it, and I'm talking to my child, uh, the objective is to be listened to. I want to be listened to. The action, I command you if I choose that action. Maybe I do it firmly, so it comes out as a firm command, stop it, yeah? And then the obstacle. Well, what's in the way? The child is crying because they want their toy and it's dinner time and they can't have it. So they're not listening to me. 
Now I might make that choice at home, but be prepared for, you might get on set or get in rehearsal and the director says, hmm, can you do it differently? Can you give me another action? They might say, can you, uh, can you cajole the child? So that would change the meaning. Um, and I could still do it firmly. So I, I cajole you firmly, stop it. Or I warn you firmly, stop it. So you, you're changing the way you're saying it. Now this might not work for everyone. Actioning isn't for everyone. I've got lots of actor friends who absolutely hate it. Um, but I really love it. For me, it's opened up possibility uh, for different ways of doing it. And it gets me out of the habit of learning something by rote. So you know when you learn it and you can't say it any other way. If you apply an action, you, you've constantly got in the back of your head that that action is changeable. Um, and also, I'm not sure if I mentioned that yet. I'll mention that in a minute. So let's talk about the want. So what I want in this moment also, an objective, might not be um, something that I want long term. So there's a difference. There's different types of objectives. If you have a super objective, a main objective, that means uh, something that you really want in life. Your E-Day fix, it's the main thing in your life. So maybe I want my character um, a really big family. But my objective in this moment might be, I really want a cup of tea. Uh, that's a smaller objective and it's not, um, it's not the same as the, the, the main trajectory. Sorry, I just saw, thank you Stuart, that's so nice. <laughs> um, okay, you've thrown me off now, where am I going? Yes, objectives. So we've got our objectives, we've got our table. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you right now. It took me a really long time to get my head around it. Um, and it's not simple. It's a, it's a process. It's, when we talked about our process, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, if you've got any questions about it, I'm happy to talk to you about my understanding of it. Um, but as I say, it's not for everyone and it's not the only way to investigate a text. There's lots of ways to do it, but this isn't the way I like to do it. Let's quickly move on now to part three. So we've done all of this fabulous script work. We've read it hundreds of times. We've investigated every line and every possible meaning behind it. But it's all no good if you can't embody all that detail. Because acting isn't an academic exercise. It's, it's a physical uh, doing, actors do, we, we perform. So you need to be able to embody that. So I'm gonna mention that uh, now at this stage of the process. So part three, for those who are still keeping notes. Um, I think it falls into two categories. So how do I physicalize my character and how do I vocalize my character? A good start would be to consider the habits and the tics that you might have as an actor. So how do you move? How do you walk? Uh, for example, about myself, I know that when I'm, I get really passionate about something, my chin comes out and I'm like, oh, please understand and listen. Um, and I know that that might not be appropriate for every character that I wish to play. So it's a habit I need to notice. Don't judge it. It's okay to have habits. It's how you've survived this long and how you've gotten to this point in your life and your body has coped. Um, just notice it and allow that to be something that you can consider whether you wanna add that to the character or not. And then when you've identified the habit, um, think about the psychology behind it. You know, since you know the psychology of your character now, you might be able to decide on a habit that they might have that isn't one that comes natural to you. Um, but beware, this might be rejected by the director, so stay flexible. Amanda Brennan is an acting teacher and coach who works at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, and she wrote a fantastic book called The Energetic Performer. Now, I'm not a movement teacher, and I don't know that much about my own body yet, I'm still learning. So if you're interested in this stuff um, and you wanna learn more about the anatomy of an actor, I would highly recommend this book um, if you're interested in looking more about the physicality of actors into character. I'll give you a reading list at the end as well. Um, the next thing to consider, the voice. So 
a voice coach is a wonderful resource for an actor but I think you can start to think about what your character's accent or dialect or language is before you engage with a voice coach. Study people who are native to the accent or language that your character is, is in and if possible get them to record the lines for you so you can listen and you can mimic and try and make those sounds. And someone gave me a really good tip about accents. They said don't choose a generic accent and try and learn that. Pick on one person and learn their accent. Um, I think that makes it really specific and I think it's a good way to try and engage with accents. Um, so working with a voice coach, you'll be able to locate where your accent resonates in your vocal anatomy. So that means that wh where does it sit in your body? And I think, okay, so why would we work on an accent? That is a question. Uh, I am from the Northwest in, in the UK and I've lived in London for 10 years. So it's become a bit of a hybrid accent but it's not going to be appropriate for every character that I would like to play. So I think studying accents is a really important thing for an actor to do, whether you have a script or not, you know, get out there and look at, you know, what, what could I do convincingly? Um, and it might be boxed in. So once you've started to explore the physicality of the character and the voice of the character, you've got all this lovely knowledge now and detail from the script analysis that you've done you can start to have a think about the behavior. So lots of actors are really scared of the word improvisation. It's a scary word, but I think, you know, because you've done all this wonderful word on the text, it means now that you have the freedom to play. You know who this person is. So try existing for a while in the character, not necessarily saying the lines. Um, I think a good way to experiment with that is to improvise at home at first with, if you're nervous with it. Why not try to complete everyday mundane tasks in character? Uh, so take a shower, make a cup of tea, make the dinner, uh, take out the rubbish. And would your character do that? Why wouldn't they do that? How do they feel about having to do that? Start to experiment with your voice and your physicality and bring that to life. And all those details are gonna be there under the surface and you might make discoveries about your character that you hadn't expected. Um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, there's two books I could recommend to you by Uta Hagen, um, and they are called A Challenge for the Actor and Respect for Acting. You work through daily activities and improvisation in, a great, in great detail, and I think that's really good homework for actors to do. Now, uh, we're starting to move around in the character now and we've considered the physicality and the voice, but another element, which I think is endlessly fun to play with, are clothes and shoes and hair and makeup. Now, if you're lucky enough to be in a professional production, you will have a costume designer and an artist to collaborate with and make your character. But I see no harm in starting to experiment with that at home with your script. In fact, I think it's really important because imagine if you uh, have to work in a corset or a pair of high heels, for example, and you wait until the day of shooting or the day of rehearsal to do that, well, you're going to find not just physically and vocally that things have changed, but also psychologically and emotionally maybe, and you've got enough to remember. So rehearse in that corset, rehearse in those heels if that's, if that's what you need. It will affect everything about the performance. Um, a good place to find things, uh, charity shops or thrift stores, um, markets, the wardrobes of family and friends, you know, but don't choose anything from your own wardrobe because you already have a relationship with that item. Find something new that you can, uh, that you can try on. Okay. Oh yeah, I wanted to share this quote with you. RuPaul, he says, or he, they say, you are she. It's a she, right? It's she. Uh, you are born naked and the rest is drag. I absolutely love that. And you know why? Because it's true. I love, uh, I love that, you know, you're creating an audience impression of your character through codes and signals in the choices that you've made. So it's a subconscious, but it's an effective way of telling the story. 
it doesn't just apply to a character but to life you know everything that you choose to wear and how you choose to present yourself it reveals something about you psychologically that um whether you like it or not really it's a narrative in your clothes so a note on costume as well i think the word costume it's a little bit uh, it takes the magic out of being a character for an actor i think the word costume it belongs to directors and stage managers and crew uh, and that's great it's it's the way we describe it but for an actor i think it stops you from taking ownership to force yourself to take ownership of the character if you call it clothes they're your clothes um and same with props if that that's not that's not a, a prop mug that's my mug it's your character's mug uh, it will force you into that ownership and get you to start thinking differently about your character to realize it so i hope you found these things useful even if uh, you've heard some things that you think don't work for you that's okay disregard it I'd, I'd encourage you to just experiment and, um, you know, try and create detail and meaning for yourself, uh, for your characterizations. A dear friend of mine at East 15, her name's Jerry McAlpine, she, uh, she introduced me to the iceberg idea. You've probably heard this, but the audience see this much, the top of the iceberg, or oh, that's the performance, but all the work underneath is the rest of the iceberg. That's, um, that's, that's all the text work. For me, that's the script analysis, you know. Um, and I, I love that analogy. It sticks in my head. Now, before we go to questions, I just want to throw in some extra things here. I think it's very important to say that acting is a collaborative process and you can't do it alone. But, but the things that you can do alone, I think make you a more valuable member of the team and of the thing that you're trying to create. So, I think be generous with that, you know, and be generous with your time. If another actor uh, wants to rehearse the script, then then do that. If they want to run lines, give them your time. You know, they're, you're there to support each other. Even if you feel like you know your lines already, that doesn't matter. You, you should support each other and always be there for each other. Um, what else should I mention? Oh, yeah. If, if you have the luxury of time and of, of rehearsal, I think it would be great if you could improvise the events, the moments in the script that are mentioned but are not explicit. So if a party or a conversation is mentioned in the script but it hasn't actually happened, improvise that conversation with the other actor. It will give you a shared memory and help you create a world. And stay flexible. Remember that this work, you know, it can change even if you've made all these wonderful decisions at home. Uh, in the moment, fundamentally you have to listen and you have to respond and acting is reacting so give them uh, your full attention and give give back what they give you throw the ball pass the ball back and forth and just trust that the work that you've done all of this amazing uh, detail it's going to just sit under the surface and it will simmer under the surface and you will know who that person is and how they would respond to that great so uh, the books that I wanted to recommend to you are, if you're writing this down still, Actions, The Actors Thesaurus, who looks like this. You can use any thesaurus, by the way, but this one's nice and small. Um, a Challenge for the Actor, Uta Hagen. Respect for Acting, Uta Hagen. Tackling Text and Subtext, Barbara Hausman. The Actor Speaks, Patsy Rodenberg. Essential Acting, Bridget Panette. Acting Stanislavski, John Gillett. And Actors work and creating a character, Konstantin Stanislavski, to the actor, Michael Chekhov, and the energetic performer, Amanda Brennan. And I think I'll throw in one for good measure, just because they're all of a certain thought. Uh, true and false, David Mamet. And that's the end of my, um, my session with you. And are there any questions? That was amazing. That was so good. Um, so I think, thank you so much, Sophie, for that. I, I learned loads and I could see all of you guys right in a way. Um, the, um, the book at the end there and anything else that um, we haven't managed to write down quickly, um, we will be posting them again. So don't worry, we'll send them again. Um, 
I've got quite a few people asking if you can share the book list. So I'm wondering if maybe you could do that on social media somewhere. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, wicked. Well, um, let's do that first. So what's your social media handle for everyone? Um, at Sophie Mensa, so that's S O P H I E M E N S A H. So that's on Twitter. So um, give Sophie a follow, and um, she'll post out those that book list, um, and then um, hopefully, will you post out the notes from the from today as well? So I'll do the uh, the handout that I've created for you, which is just a summary of everything that I've fumbled today, and I'll do um, a book list for you. And if you've got any questions, then feel free to uh, to tweet me. Oh my god, amazing! That's great. So I'm going to come to a few questions that we've had. So um, first of all, we've got a question from Layla, who's asked, um, should a child actor use this process as well, or do you recommend different methods for children? I've never worked with children. Um, I think it's very complicated for a little one. Um, it depends on the age. I think it's fine for teenagers to start thinking about process. But I think when you're a child, uh, there's a lot of natural play involved. and I think to do what's best for them, I'm not sure script analysis would work because I'm not sure what their level of comprehension would be. It depends on the child. Yeah, good. Yeah, really, really good point. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to like keep up with all these questions. Um, we've got a turn and we've got loads of people giving really lovely feedback and saying they've so much out of the session. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to see all of that. Thanks, guys. Um, Manny has asked, what was the quote right at the beginning of the session? And who was that by? Because I think you mentioned that people should have a little look into her. Yes. So there is an Italian actress called Eleonora Duse. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But she was born in 58 and she was known uh, for um, being able to blush on stage. She didn't wear a lot of makeup on stage because she could naturally blush. So she was a silent film star before she became an actor. And the quote I read from her was, uh, where is it? She said, he who claims to teach art understands nothing whatsoever about it. Very, I love that. Very good. Um, Tahir has asked, um, what advice has Sophie got for staying calm before auditions? Say again? Uh, what advice have you got for staying calm, for keeping your nerves at bay? Um, I, I think we all have nerves. I mean, I, I'm super nervous. I'm nervous now with you guys watching me. Um, I, I think take a breath is always a good thing. Um, I text my mom all the time before I'm about to do something. I, I think coping mechanisms are really individual, you know, and um, it, it's up to you to, to know what you need before you go in. Back to our unique needs sheets, they apply to life as well, you know. If you need certain things before an audition, make sure you've got them in place. And remember, just take your time. Everyone wants you to do well. I learned really late on, I wish I'd known when I was 21, everyone's on my side. And I'd go in like I was trying to get a job, you know, and it's not about that. They, they want you to be to do it and they, they want you in the room. Yeah. So. yeah, they want you to, as an director, producer, director, so everyone wants you to do it well. And you want to be able to speak to your personality. So don't go into an audition room with nerves that then affect you being yourself. Everyone wants to see people in their real self. So uh, Michael has asked, which of these techniques would you use if you only had 24 hours to prep a scene or self-tape with some sides? Um, well, it depends on how much you, yeah, if you've only got sides, you haven't got a full idea of the character because you don't have the whole script, which happens often. But you're in, you've been selected for a reason, so the casting director will know more than you do at this stage. So what you have to do, I think, is trust that they, they've brought you in because there's something about your characterization of you as an actor that they like, that they respond to, that's good for that character. So learn the lines you can. Um, I would still action them. So I would still uh, work out, uh, I do that table, you know, how can, I, how can I say that line and try and give it a bit of detail, but just be off book and, and really, um, really know how you want to say it. 
And if they ask you to change it, maybe it's a good idea to do a few extra actions so that you can be a little bit more free with it and take direction. Yes, definitely. I think it's really good when you're um, trying to prepare for an audition where you do only have one page of size to prepare it the way that you want and you interpret it to be, but then also try it a few different ways with a little bit of a different cadence in the wording or think of it in a, maybe a little different of tone um, just so that you can be flexible when you're in the room because we all give you notes and want you to change it straight away, basically. Um, so, um, oh God, I'm just, I'm just seeing loads of really nice messages. Questions? Uh, okay, for musical theatre scripts, how would you analyse what a song means to the character? Um, well, I think songs are even more generous with characterization. They give you so much information in the lyrics. So I would action the, the, the song like it's a monologue. You know, I would take each line and find out what my intention is. And obviously it will change because you're singing it. So there's different techniques that you have to use. But at least you've thought about the story that you're going to tell with the song. I mean, I don't call myself a singer. I'm an actor who attempts to sing. Um, but you, you know, you're making, uh, you're, you're making sense of the story and the detail. Yeah, great. Um, Gia has asked, what were the headings for the table? Mm, table, uh, I will put this up online as well. This is gonna be on your summary, but they are what you want. So your motivation or objective, what, your, what the character wants in that moment. The action is what the character does to get what they want the means, how they play their action, and the obstacle, what is in the way of them getting what they want. Great, perfect. Jeff has asked, um, this was the best, best meeting, that's not a question, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> um, is there a difference between studying theatre script versus film and TV? I think you should approach it however works for you. It's going to change every time with different scripts. No two scripts are going to be the same. But I, I would always cherry pick what I think might work. Um, and it's changing all the time. I mean, if you guys want to share tips with me about how you do it, I'm happy to steal from you as well and add to my arsenal. <laughs> um, Alicia has asked... Um, Oh, she hasn't. That's just a lovely comment. And um, here we go. Chris. Chris has asked, are these techniques applicable to one online scripts for TV co-star options? Is that like a uh, five five lines or less part? One, one of those things, do you mean? Yeah. I um, yeah, I think. Like, like what you said with the uh, the map, the relationship map you are the, the main character in your story. So I think even if you only have a couple of lines, you know, still think about who, you're, who you are and what your history is. Even if nobody knows about it, it will add a layer to your, uh, your performance and your characterization. Great. Um, so I've got a multiple question um, from Dina. Um, I'm just going to read the whole thing out and then, and then um, you can answer <laughs> um, from that. So, um, the timeline before the story starts, how can we fill that in? Is that imaginatively? And how do we know if that's correct? Should we be speaking to the directors? And what if they aren't particular, particularly communicative? Um, any advice? So... It can be as detailed or as plain as you like. I think it's just a summary for you of what happened in the story. If we did Goldilocks and the Three Bears, it could be as simple as the bears came, um, uh, no, sorry, Goldilocks came and then the bears left. It can be really plain or it could be Goldilocks turned and looked at the door. So you, you can really go into detail, um, but it's up to you and how much time you have. And if you want to make a huge detailed one, that's fine. But what, what works for you, I think, is important. And in terms of the director, I think um, with stories, it is their baby. So you always have, if they don't necessarily want to engage with that stuff, I wouldn't push it. They, they will always come to you if, if, they, um, if they are that kind of director and they like to work that way. Um, I would just, uh, 
I'm sorry, I've forgotten that second part of the question with the the. Uh, the second part was, um, yeah, if the if the director <laughs> if the director is in um, communicative, um, how do we work out our own backstory and yeah, I guess. Um, if they're not very communicative, they probably trust you to do it and and to to bring the character if they're not asking many questions. So it's for you, isn't it? If it's your it's for your characterization. They don't need to know the ins and outs or how you got there. They just want the performance and that they want to see that you're, you're being truthful. Um, so keep it for yourself. It's nice to have secrets. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Um, Eva has asked, do I need a degree or to attend film school to make it in the industry? Yeah, to go to drama school or have a degree? No, you don't. You don't <laughs> drama school. I, I've, I've got loads of degrees from drama, but I've been lucky and privileged enough to, to work in my life and, and, and get, those, get those degrees. But you don't need to train. You can learn at home how to be an actor. It's about human, human life. It's about the human condition. And I think that's, you can never learn that. I am gonna learn it hopefully until the day I die about acting. I think it, you never stop learning how to be a person. Yeah, that's such a great answer. Um, Joseph has asked, um, how, how can you, how do you get comfortable with your voice and body, especially when you feel self-conscious of your acting? Mm, it's like juggling, isn't it? You know, <laughs> am I doing the voice? Am I doing the, the physicality? Am I, hopefully with enough, uh, rehearsal for you. I don't just mean in the, in the room with a director, I mean being in character with the details that we've talked about with script analysis, hopefully it, it sets in and you feel that juggling act that we all feel. Um, you find a, a happy medium and often you're not thinking about that when you're performing, you're just trying to communicate and listen to the other actor and hopefully that stuff, some of it will remain like residue, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, last question, and then we're going to wrap it up, I'm afraid. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who was starting out a little bit later in life? I actually think you might be at an advantage um, because, you know, you've got those, that life experience and you've got years. I mean, when uh, I, I first auditioned at drama school, I auditioned everywhere and I didn't get in anywhere. And that was because I didn't have enough life experience. I didn't know enough about myself even to handle that kind of training. And I think if you're approaching this later on in life, you've got a lot to offer the industry and, and, and the script. And I would just trust that you're an artist in your own right and you don't need, uh, you don't need a qualification. And you don't need um, to be a young face. You can be, we, there's all sorts of characters out there that can make a world and the industry needs that to tell stories. Yeah. And also, I would just say that the stories and the things that are being commissioned now are much less likely to be the usual young person leading a story. We, we are seeing a lot more, which is very universal. So I think that is also an advantage because when people come out of drama school and at a, at a young age, the, it's quite um, crowded in terms of the amount of talent that happens, it's just so much. And then as you get older and older and older, as you work in, in the past instances, the options do seem to get a little bit thinner. So I think if you commit yourself to it and you are developing your talent and coming into it later, just from a casting perspective, is actually quite great. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, just remind everyone what your Twitter was again. So uh, on Twitter, I'm Sophie Mensa, which is spelled S-O-P-H-I-E-M-E-N-S-A-H. And on Instagram, I'm I am Sophie Mensa. <laughs> Great. And um, if you uh, want to follow Backstage, we're at Backstage on Twitter and we're at Backstage Cast on Instagram. I am at Hannah Casting on Twitter. Um, if you guys enjoyed today, I'd really love it if you could tag us um, and let us know what you got out of it. Um, we've got so much going on with Backstage at the moment. It's a really exciting time. So 
Um, even though it's a bit bleak outside, we've got all of these events that are bringing a lot of inspiration to everyone. So do keep an eye on our website um, and you'll see um, what we've got going on. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Emily.